This is mini lecture number six, covering night section 2.3. Before I cover section 2.3, let's do a lightning review of one example from section 2.2. Quarterback Bill threw the ball at 15 meters per second. It went down the field for three seconds. So this is uniform velocity, one, two, three seconds. And it got down the field to 45 meters. So this is 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. This is where the ball got after three seconds. At this point, Carlos intercepts and the ball goes, runs the ball at half that speed, seven and a half meters per second, all the way past Bill and all the way for a touchdown for a total of 60 meters of running. Now, if you figure out 60 meters of running, divided by 7.5 meters per second, you'll see that Carlos needed eight seconds to run that distance. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. That's the T values and the time is in seconds. This is the position in meters. At t equals 11, we've gotten to minus 15. This is all the way back to the touchdown point. So there's minus 10, there's minus 20. Minus 15 would be across about to here, to there. So that's what happens over those eight seconds. And if I do this perfectly, this would have gone through the t equals nine point. So this is x as a function of t. Now, the cool thing is, is that you can get vx as a function of t pretty easily because vx is just the slope of x. And the slope of x here was 15 meters per second. So for that one, two, three, we're up here at 15 meters per second. And then the slope is minus seven and a half meters per second. So for the next four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we're at uh, minus seven and a half meters per second. So this is uh, vx equals plus 15 meters per second. And this is vx equals minus seven and a half meters per second. And this is a discontinuity where the ball was intercepted and it suddenly turned around going the opposite way. Now the question for you, and the, really the answer is all of section 2.3, is can you start with a graph like this and get a graph like this? Because here, we had a story, and we made a graph like this, and then we can go by using slopes to a graph like this. So we're trying to turn that question around. Suppose this is the story. Can we get uh, this? And the answer is yes. And I want to give you an example, not reuse the same example. So in my example, a particle is going to go one meter per second for one second, then it's going to go two meters per second for the next second, and then it's going to go three meters per second for two more seconds. We should give these some names. That's two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. This is time, and I guess once and again I'll call it V. Now, can you go from something like this, and these are discontinuities here, to a graph of x as a function of t? And the answer is you can. So suppose the particle is at 0 at t equals 0. It's like an additional bit of information. I need to solve this problem. I need to know where it started. Once I know where it started, I can say, well, it went one meter per second for one second. Now, one meter per second times one second is one meter. So at the end of the first second, it was at one meter. Up. For the next second, it went two meters per second. All right. Two meters per second times one second 
was two meters. So I went two more meters here. There's two meters. So now we're at three meters and we're at t equals one second and we're at t equals two seconds. So we've gotten to here. Okay. And now for the final two seconds, it goes three meters per second. Three meters per second times two more seconds is six meters. Whoa, so we need six more meters on top of this. So we're at nine at t equals four seconds. Let's draw some straight lines through all of that stuff. There's what's happened for the first second. There's what's happened for the second second. And there's what's happened for the third second. This is one meter, two meter, three meters, four meters, five meters, six meters, seven meters, eight meters, nine meters. Now, I want to show you something that's kind of cool. I want you to count up with one second bought as your base of a square and one meter per second as your height of a square. I want you to count up the number of squares under this curve, okay? So here's a curve. I want you to figure out that area. Well, this width is one second, that height is one meter per second, that's one meter. And now look at this. This is still one second wide, but it's two meters per second tall. So the area there is two meters. And this is two seconds wide and three meters per second tall. So the area there, watch this. One, two, three, four, five, and six. There is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine meters underneath that curve. Interesting, this thing finished at nine meters. It's not a coincidence. The amount of time traveled times the rate of travel rep is represented by that area. And summing up all those areas gives me the total distance traveled. So in other words, the total distance traveled can be determined by the area under the curve, or the distance up to any given time can be determined by the area under the curve up until that time. That means that to go from a graph of Vx as a function of t to a graph of x as a function of t, you need to figure out the area under the curve, which is the integral. Oh my gosh. So we've learned that going this way involves getting slopes off of graphs. To go from x to v sub x involves getting slopes off of graphs, which in calculus land is called taking the derivative. And we've learned that going from a problem that's stated like this to a solution like this involves taking the area under the curve, which in calculus land is called taking the integral. So what we've learned and what section 2.3 is all about is how to get from velocity as a function of time to position as a function of time with the knowledge that what you're trying to compute is the area under the curve. This would be a good place to stop and think and actually stop and think really hard because we have covered pages 40, 41, 42, and 43. And we've covered them by examples. On pages 40, 41, and 42, Knight hits quite a bit of calculus theory. Doing the same thing I did here, counting up squares and areas, but in a little bit more um, mathematical way. And once you've uh, reviewed that, definitely do the stop to thinks 2.3 and make sure you know how to calculate the area under the curve in each of these examples so that you know if you were given the initial part position of the particle and you calculated the area under the curve, you could find the final position of the particle. 
And after you've done that stop to thinking, let's go on to section 2.4. Section 2.4 is perhaps the most important special case of all this stuff. It's the situation of constant acceleration. Now first we have to define what constant acceleration even is. Acceleration is changing velocity. So here are some examples of problems with, at least for a short period of time, or some period of time, the velocity was fixed. So there's vx, there's t. At least for this period of time, the velocity was fixed, and then it jumped to something else, and now it's fixed at some other value. Acceleration is when the velocity is changing. There's an example of velocity changing. That's actually a pretty complicated example. Let's make a simpler example. So here's an example where velocity is changing. What is this example in words? Well, if we put some units on here, let's say that this top of this thing is 30 meters per second. And let's say out here we have 10 seconds. What this says is that at t equals zero, a particle is going 30 meters per second. And then it slowed steadily down. The amount of change in its velocity for any given amount of time was constant. It slowed steadily down for 10 seconds until it got to a halt. In each second, it slowed down by 3 meters per second. So there it's going 27 meters per second, there it's going 24 meters per second, there it's going 21 meters per second, there it's going 18 meters per second, 15 meters per second, 12 meters per second, 9 meters per second, 6 meters per second, 3 meters per second, and 0 meters per second. That's constant acceleration, or a little more colloquially in this case, constant deceleration. The area under this curve is this time, which was 10 seconds, times this height, which is 30 meters per second, divided by two, because, hey, there's only half of this triangle that's actually under the curve. So it's one half times 10 seconds times 30 meters per second, which is 300 meters times one half, which is equal to 150 meters. So I claim that if a particle starts at 30 meters per second and takes 10 seconds to decelerate to no velocity, then that will particle will go 150 meters in that time. Okay, so I'd like to wrap up mini lecture number six. And I'd like to wrap up mini lecture number six by summarizing the situation in section 2.4. In section 2.4, we introduce the notion of constant acceleration, which means that in any given time, delta t, the amount that v changes, like say delta v sub x, is a constant. And we call that constant a sub x. This is uniform acceleration. Here are some examples of uniform acceleration. A particle starts, stops off at rest. It's velocity now is that v sub x goes up linearly for a while. Uh, here, it changes to some new, maybe decelerates rather rapidly for a while. This is a region of constant positive acceleration, and this is a region of even stronger negative acceleration, which we also call deceleration. Now, what we've seen back in section 2.3 is that if you want to know the distance traveled by a particle during this time, all you have to do is chop this up into triangles and figure out the areas of the triangles. And so all the formulas, and believe me, there are a lot of formulas, all the formulas for constant acceleration boil down to finding the areas under triangles under various situations. Well, that's a huge amount. I will see you tomorrow.